Welcome, my friends. This is Dave, and today we have more scandal, more controversy, more information about what Assassin's Creed Shadows used to be, what it could have been, and probably what they're going to try to make it back into to appease all of this backlash that they're getting from everybody, especially the Japanese people. All right, let's get into it. Let's do it. Hey everyone, it's Endymion, and since my last video about Assassin's Creed Shadows, I've been given some more information on the original game's plot, as well as some other things. I also got some news I heard from sources about the whole Ghost of Tsushima and Yote situation as well, and I think a lot more people need to know about this too. Firstly, let me start with what I was told recently. I was contacted by someone who worked on the original version of Assassin's Creed Shadows, and they laid out to me what the story was before it was eventually scrapped by Ubisoft for the Yasuke story. Originally, the plot of Shadows was supposed to surround a piece of Eden like other games called the Sword of Eden. It now, that would totally make sense. Because it's the whole Eden theme throughout all of the assassination... Er, uh, the games, Assassin's Creed games. Was an Isu artifact like the Apple or the Staff in Odyssey, but this sword would corrupt its wielders with power and then give them dominion over others. The hero of the original story was named Taka Yamauchi, who was a Shinto monk. Mm. Taka was decided to be a follower of Shintoism because it was a unique religion within Japan at the time, which would give Taka an interesting viewpoint of the world around him. This was chosen because the writers on Shadows wanted to give the audience a glimpse into a world that was foreign to many, and it was juxtaposed against the idea that the Shinto monk wanted nothing to do with conflict or the wars that were being engulfed by nobles. See, that would that sounds like a totally awesome concept. And to build into this whole aspect, this duality that needs to arise from this monk because he's all about peace and everything. But if he has to be forced or is corrupted by the sword, or if he's got to be forced to like fight off whatever, like the evil powers or whatever, that is, that is really cool. And that would have made for a very interesting story. Ah, it's too bad. So pretty much, the hero was a badass nice guy who wanted to garden all day and just meditate. But of and another thing that I uh, heard is that, uh, and I'm not sure if they're going to cover it in this video, is that uh, before they switched over to the Yasuke story, and that is rumored to be because of certain things um, surrounding, I guess, the George Floyd uh, death and, uh, I, I don't know, the, the rise of the influence of Black Lives Matter at the time back in 2020, but uh, apparently, uh, they had the main character that they just talked about. They had his model set and, uh, I guess, fully polished or whatever, ready for, uh, you know, to put into the game. And they also had the animations all set up for this guy. I don't know if they had all, like, the battle animations and stuff like that, but they definitely had enough that they could start building the game with that that character in it and they just stripped it all out to put Yasuke in there. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Of course, like any good badass would, the danger finds them eventually. Apparently the story would have switched into high gear when Oda Nobunaga was killed. In case you don't know, in real life events, Oda Nobunaga was a famous lord that was murdered by his own trusted general named Akechi Mitsuhide. In the new version of Shadows, Yasuke was a slave that is bought by Oda from the Jesuits when they come to Japan. And the very little details of the real-life aspects of Yasuke that we do know, at least we do know that he did carry Oda's tools around and he would dance like a fool in front of his guests because Yasuke's skin was black and he was a very large man. Was Oda Nobunaga racist towards Yasuke in this sense? Absolutely. But I mean, it was a different time, of course, where a black man would stand out like a sore thumb amidst the rest of the Japanese populace. Actually, anybody that's much taller than the Japanese people stick out like a sore thumb in the Japanese populace. I, I uh, lived in Japan and Okinawa for two years, and I had some uh, as a missionary, just in case you want to know. And I'm, I'm a kind of short guy, so I kind of, <laughs> I kind of fit in 
Um, weirdly, there were a lot of uh, the Okinawans that thought at the time I was much thinner, uh, that I looked a lot like Tom Cruise. Everybody called me Tom Cruise. I, I, I don't know why. But I had a lot of uh, the people I worked with, essentially. Um, the, the, some of them were, like, over six feet. And they would have to, like, get a bend down to, like, enter houses and just walking around in general in public. Uh, and there were Caucasian. Uh, and they were still, like, everyone's, like, oohing and aahing. Or, or, or sometimes they would just, like, see us coming down the street. And they would literally just, like, especially, like, the younger kids, they would literally just, like, turn around. They're like, nope. <laughs> like, they, like, had the other, I don't know why, because we weren't threatening or anything like that. But... Yeah, uh, and especially a, a big, gigantic, six-foot-something black dude would definitely draw eyeballs and attention anywhere he went. You couldn't get around it. Anyway, like I was saying, Taka Yamauchi, our hero, would be in a nearby temple when the fall of Odu Nabanaga happens. A fugitive would then come to Taka's temple from that said battle and would reveal himself to be Hattori Hanzo, who if you don't- Oh man, that was such a better storyline and it's all based on like real people that- Ugh. Why did they give up on the storyline? Hattori Hanzo, it's Kill Bill, right? I mean, that's that he went to Okinawa, or she did, to uh, to get- uh, Atari Hanzo, well, I mean, obviously, Atari Hanzo, the real person, was living way back then, but in, in Kill Bill, he, she got the story. Anyways, that's crazy. This is so much better of a storyline. Wow, they were, they just dropped the ball. Seriously. Oh, no, he was one of the legendary ninjas of that same time period in real life. He was an actual person that was instrumental to the legend that we know today of Japanese shinobi. Hattori Hanzo would be wounded upon meeting Taka and would reveal that he had but one possession in his care, which would be revealed as a sort of Eden taken from the hands of Odu Nobunaga after his death by Akechi Mitsuhide and his band of murderous power-hungry samurai brethren. Akechi Mitsuhide would announce that Hattori Hanzo was a traitor for stealing the sword, pinning the whole murder of Odu Nabunaga on him and using the confusion of the chaos of his lord's death to make it seem like Akechi was not the one who landed the killing blow. So, the entirety of Japan was out looking for this shinobi man who unbeknownst to Taka was carrying the Sword of Eden that could change the fate of Japan depending on who wielded it. I like the idea of the story so far. Sure, the sword is fantastical, but all Assassin's Creed had this concept, so it fits right in. And it uses the real-life individuals of that time to make a compelling narrative that I would actually want to explore. But there's more, so let's keep going. Taka would agree to treat Hanzo's wounds and would shelter his presence from Akechi and his samurai. Within this newfound trust, Hanzo would reveal to Taka that he belonged to a mysterious clan unbeknownst to the outside world of Iga Shinobis that were working <laughs> to save Japan from the clutches of Akechi Mitsuhide and his corrupt samurai. These Iga Shinobis would be revealed as the Japanese branch of the Hidden Ones. And this is how Taka would get introduced to the creed of the assassins, Akechi Mitsuhide and his men, would also visit Taka's temple looking for information on whether he saw a wounded man carrying an item on him. But Taka would skillfully dissuade Akechi and his men and then throw them off of Hanzo's trail. I don't know if Hanzo would die or not in this story, but apparently one of the big branching narratives was going to be Taka going against Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who in real life was a peasant-born man who would eventually rise to become the regent of Japan and was considered the second great unifier of the country. He was also considered one of the most influential and powerful men in Japanese history, and was directly tied to Odu Nobunaga during his reign before Akechi Mitsuhide murdered him in revenge. At some point in the story, as I was told, this Toyotomi Hideyoshi would come into possession of the Sword of Eden himself, and he would then use it to sway the people of Japan to his side and Taka, now a part of the Iga Shinobi's Hidden Ones, would be waging a secret war against Toyotomi and Akechi in order to secure the sword and ensure Japan was freed of this 
Templar Samurai Rule. Apparently, Toyotomi would refer to himself as the Demon King of the Six Heavens and was clearly becoming corrupted <laughs> by the Isu technology within the Sword of Eden that was warping his mind, and would likely turn him into an untrustworthy madman who would think that everyone was out to get him. According to my sources, the story would eventually end with Taka defeating Akechi Mitsuhide for killing Odu Nobunaga, and eventually, within the shadows, taking down Toyotomi Hideyoshi and claiming the Sword of Eden for the Iga Shinobi Hidden Ones. The story would then end with Tokugawa Iyasu, who was the first shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate, ushering in a new era for Japan that would span from 1603 all the way to 1868 when the Meiji Restoration would happen. Like Toyotomi, Tokugawa was also considered one of the great unifiers of Japan. But from what I understand from this story, Tokugawa Iyasu would not use the Sword of Eden to control the people of Japan. Instead, he would use charity and community to usher in a new era for Japan. This is so much better. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. And it actually, the way they're talking about it, like weaves it into like the actual history of what ends up being J the Japanese rule, right? Back in the day. I mean, obviously they're, they're taking liberties here, but they're using real historic characters and they're weaving it into this intricate storyline that still deals with the, the assassin uh, association and the basically the Templars, the, the evil guys, right? The, the bad samurai. Oh, come on. That's this is gold. This is gold. It would have been so good. The story would have ended with the Shinto monk named Taka Yamauchi fading into the shadows with the hidden ones to conceal the Sword of Eden so that it may never be used by another madman ever again. It was a classic story in terms of Assassin's Creed, I know, but I think it fits perfectly into what these games were about in my opinion. According to my sources, which I asked if I was able to tell their experiences while working with Ubisoft, they said it was fine, so I'll tell you that now. They said they were very quickly flown out to Japan after being hired by Ubisoft for this very ambitious project. They also took many notes while researching the historical period, and they found navigating a foreign city to be very challenging to do at the time. On the weekends, they it said is. that they were taken to various temples and shrines, and were shown concepts like Shinto purification hand cleaning rituals, and shrines that existed between modern day skyscrapers. They also told me they are still mad to this day that Ubisoft was willing to invest so much time and money into what they were calling a bad mobile game, over their AAA Japanese Assassin's Creed game that they were also co-developing. I assume they meant the upcoming Assassin's Creed Jade game, which if you don't know, is a Chinese-led Assassin's Creed game that is made in tandem with Tencent. Apparently, the story that was written by these original writers involving Taka Yamauchi, the Sword of Eden, and all of that, was heavily scrutinized by the Shadow's head development team. According to my sources, most of what was made or written by the original Shadow's team was largely abandoned by the now Shadow's devs. Uh. This all happened between 2015 to 2016 according to them. So this wow. game has been on in and off development for almost a decade at this point. Wow, I my didn't know that. My source also told me they did hear that the bulk of the story and direction was changed during 2020, like I previously mentioned in my other video. And they do believe that the political climate of that time, including George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, did lead to Yasuke being inserted over Taka Yamauchi. So when my previous sources told me that they saw a fully created Japanese male protagonist, I can only assume that what they saw was indeed Taka Yamauchi as he was intended to be shown in the game. That just blows my mind that they would uh, invest all of that money, fly a team over to Japan to actually study, and I'm sure they took loads of photos and videos and to document things so that they could bring it back to the art department and the modelers and whatever they needed uh, to, do, to, to, to do all of that and to build a character which takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, to get the, the, the rigging done, to put the animations together, the mocap, whatever they did to do that, and then to just dump it 
not just the character, but like the storyline. It just boggles my mind that this company, and it sounds like they totally replaced the dev team, that they would have just <laughs> no backbone. They just bent the knee fully to, 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 to the woke mob, it sounds like, to the DEI uh, disciples and <laughs> just flushed everything down the toilet. I, I just, I cannot fathom that. And, I mean, they had to have lost just from doing that to switching over to Yasuke. They had to have lost millions of dollars. Millions, I'm sure of it. According to one of my sources, the reason why Taka's story was rejected was because the narrative designers at Ubisoft didn't want Shadows to be a piece of Eden of the Week story again like other games. But that's like the whole premise of the universe that they've created for Assassin's Creed. So why wouldn't they have Eden be a part of that? Oh my gosh. These uh, so frustrating. As of now, though, I am not being told what the actual plot of Shadows is as of right now. But we do know that they gender swapped Taka and combined his idea of his character with that of another legendary Iga Shinobi. But instead of Hattori Hanzo, the Shinobi chosen was Fujibayashi Nagato. Nagato was like Hanzo, one of the legendary real life Iga Shinobi. But of course, he was not chosen as the main character of Shadows, as I'm told, because he was a Japanese man. And what's very weird and how does that even make sense? How does that how does that even make sense? I just I don't understand. Like there's uh, another uh, video I, I saw and uh, they made a comment saying, like, you know, if they would have just had the the main protagonist be Japanese whether it was a guy or a woman, it doesn't matter. But if they had the guy and they also maybe had the woman as like another protagonist or maybe a slash kind of secondary character, nobody would have issues with probably anything they were doing, uh, at least character wise for this game. And then they could have also have introduced Yasuke in all of his full glory, whatever that is, but he would be very much a tertiary character you know, maybe you get to play as him, maybe like a mission or two or something like that, or I don't know, whatever concepts they have for that. But they could have had Yasuke in there and nobody would even bat an eyelash. Everybody would actually be, wow, that's kind of cool. Because Yasuke, you know, there's some historical, you know, uh, backing of who he was. You know, I don't know. It just, they could have, they could have had their cake and eat it too. But instead, they just, uh, like I said, they threw it all away for nothing, for, 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 for nothing. Ugh, so sad. Western studios is largely speaking Asian men are oftentimes treated with the same disdain as white male characters as well. So instead of Nagato being your Shadow's main character or Taka, this is why Naoe is your Shinobi in Shadows officially. She's the daughter of Fujibayashi Nagato, that's canon by the way. In the reveal trailer Dev Diary, they reveal and confirm that the name Fujibayashi Nagato is the guy in the trailer and that Naoe is his daughter. So Ubisoft quite literally took the concept of the Iga Shinobis, which was spearheaded and led by legendary male ninjas and went screw all of that. They don't matter anymore, instead, here's Naoe because women are better apparently. As I Go girl boss. I don't have any problems with their act putting a woman as a ninja. I mean, but come on, seriously? Like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> it just is. It just kills me how many bad mistakes they made <laughs> in making this game and how much money they lost right from the get go. I said in my previous video, Ubisoft wanted women to rule the gaming industry, both within dev teams and representation in media as well. And that's why it's getting worse. And it's going to get worse for all of gaming, I think, until this wave of DEI is purged from the gaming industry 
and from general culture itself. Uh, I mean, it's just like, why, how hard is it to, to be like, hey, maybe, maybe as a company, uh, I don't know, maybe we should, uh, I don't know, make money? They're going to lose so much money over the next however many, five or ten years it's going to take to get through this cycle of girl boss dominance that doesn't make sense to the storyline. I mean, if it does make sense, that's a whole nother thing, right? But if it if they're just shoving it down our throats like they tend to do, it's going to be a no-go. And you're going to see people just stop playing games. They're going to lose a ton of money. And I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know how far they're going to have to slide down in their financial woes before these dev companies and publishers get a freaking clue and are like, huh, maybe this isn't working and I don't know, maybe we should make some money for ourselves, for the company, there are shareholders. It just, it does, it's like bizarro world. It really is. It's like we slipped into some alternate dimension and like now everything's just crazy. I think a lot of this could have been avoided if they simply didn't have Yasuke because two protagonists are not something we really want in Assassin's Creed games anyways. And they should have just made Now Wei have a male variant and then you can choose whichever you want. Like, Yeah, I, that actually would have solved everything because, I mean, guys typically, I don't think, guys typically want to play as women and I don't know about women, but I would think if I was a woman and there was an option for me to play as a woman, I would do that option. You know, like the games like uh, that you can make your own characters. I think that's probably the case. I think a vast majority of the males will create a male character. A vast majority of females We'll make a female character. That's not always the case, but I think that's probably pretty true. And that that would have actually solved everything. It could have been the exact same character, exact same storyline, obviously. But hey, one year a woman, one year a guy. Easy peasy. Done. No controversy. And they're just dumping the money off at the studio in dump trucks. In Valhalla. But what's done is done, I suppose. And now instead of a cool Sword of Eden story, you're going to be getting whatever it is that Ubisoft has cooked up this time. But like I said in my previous video, they have at least 7% of the pre-orders of Valhalla in the same time period. It's a big reason why they're bombing so hard right now. That is such an epic fail. Like, that is beyond, beyond failure. <laughs> I can't believe no one's being fired for this. Besides the origins of Shadows being revealed to me, another source told me that Ubisoft is reeling in terms of development as well. And they currently have, as my source told me, an abnormal amount of female developers in their studios, which is, yes, being done on purpose. And yes, that is why this game is horrible. No offense to women. I have worked uh, as a game designer before. And we had a uh, lady producers. I don't think we had any. No, no, we had some. Uh, we had some lady uh, ladies on the actual development team. But I mean, they're fine if if, <laughs> if they're not all DEI crazy. Uh, which back in the day when I was working at the studios, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't a thing yet. So, um, but yeah, that's a huge red flag. What I was also told about Ubisoft, which was very stupid, is that in terms of the actual senior development leads working at Ubisoft natively, most of their actual talent is from contract work. That is not good. You want people in senior level uh, positions because uh, they're senior level. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They've been in the trenches. They have experience. They can solve problems way easier than if you're a noob and you have no idea what the pipeline uh, is and how that works and where you get bogged down and who's clogging what and where. Uh, it's such an intricate machine and you need people that have experience at the senior level to make it run smoothly. That's just a fact.
and an alarming amount of these actual competent developers who usually work on these projects just to ensure they, you know, make it through the door, are actually middle-aged white men. These contractors, as I'm told, which have spoken to many of my sources about their experiences not only at Ubisoft but other dev studios, is that there's a devastating lack of competence and actual talent at a lot of these Western studios these days. And essentially what is happening is these publishers will hire these senior devs that actually know what they're doing as contractors, so they don't have to display them amongst the other far less competent devs, which are mostly, as I'm being told, and don't shoot the messenger, all right? I'm just telling you what they're telling me. But these incompetent devs are mostly women and people who are diversity hires. And that is because, for whatever reason, there's just not a lot of women that go into uh, game design in whatever facet. Uh, it, it, they just don't do it. And so if you like just hire somebody because they're a woman, teach them on the fly or whatever, I don't know, maybe they got a little bit of skill, but if, if you, if, I don't know, they're just, there's just not, it's mostly men that get into game design. And that's why studios are predominantly, they have more men. <laughs> that's just the way it is. Uh, you can't just hire a woman because they were a woman so that, I don't know, your DEI ESG numbers or something, it looks better on the spreadsheet. If you do that, and yeah, I mean, even and it goes both ways. You can't just hire some dude. I mean, I guess you're not going to hire a white guy, <laughs> but, uh, if you hire just anybody that doesn't know what they're doing just to make your numbers look better the end result is going to be poor quality and it's going to show. I mean, you can't get around that. It's just like the sun rises each morning and sets each night. So case in point, competent white male devs are contracted to work on these things, not necessarily in roles that allow them to, say, change the story or approve character designs or anything like that. Those decisions are almost exclusively decided by your typical woke Marxist left-leaning activists within these studios. But since when it comes to actually making their moronic ideas a reality being harder than they expected, <laughs> they then contract these older white guys who likely make way more money off these publishers this way to make their stupid woke decisions an actual reality. So yeah, I mean, you're you're going to make way more money being a contractor typically than if you actually worked for the studio because I mean, they have to pay a premium price to get the work done, which in the end jacks up the budget and makes the game cost a lot more than what it should have if they just did things the correct way and kept it all in-house. I mean, some things are obviously going to almost always have to be uh, contracted out because maybe there's like something you need specifically for the game that maybe you just don't have the talent set. So yeah, then you look to other studios to fill that, that void or that need. But typically you should be able to have enough people in house to do everything that needs to be done. And uh, I don't know. Let's okay. Let's continue. Let's keep it going. So you end up with games that suck and are made for no one, but at least they still function as video games. But this is largely only because these contractors are working on it. It's kind of messed up when I spoke to my sources about this, but this is apparently happening all over the industry right now. Studios are filled with people who have zero idea what they're actually doing. They're being hired based on identity or gender. Yet when it comes to actually making things happen, well, it doesn't, according to my sources. In terms of what I heard about Ghost of Tsushima and Yote, it's actually far more bleak than I could imagine. Like Ubisoft mm. and others, Sucker Punch also makes games in a way that my sources told me are called Made by Committee. Basically, these games are decided, then when the actual ideas come to what gets made and put into the game, it's almost like you have the heads of each department, if you will, at a round table, but not really, of course. They could be doing it all over Zoom or something, but same idea. Anyway, they'll propose an idea like they'll say we want a male main character or a female one, and then the committee of devs will then say yes or no, and then they vote on what gets made. And this process is used for many, many different aspects of every single game being made right now. Conceptually, I think that could be a good idea in certain situations, 
but you really need to have a captain that leads the team and leads the design decisions. And, and that is the way that actually works out to be the best. Um, but when you have a committee, it <laughs> end up getting like just garbage because you can't agree on things. Some people may not speak up that should to say something uh, th- because they know it's a bad idea. You know, that whole toxic positivity thing that uh, seems to be being used now uh, in the industry by people pushing back against the woke ideologies that are being uh, pushed down our throats as consumers. But um, yeah, committees, uh, committees to make a lot of decisions are never, they're never good. It's never a good idea because it just, it, it ruins everything. Like we want more diversity, please vote yes or no. We want the story to push anti-white supremacy, say yes or no, etc. This way of making games, as I'm told, it leads to why a lot of activism nonsense makes its way into games these days. Because a bunch of activists could and likely will sit on their committee board and just through voting, will overwhelm the minority of votes to ensure that everything meets their demands. So when it comes to Naoi and Yasuke being a thing in shadows, you can almost definitely believe that it was likely voted on and decided by a committee as well. The same thing is happening at Sucker Punch right now. I was also mm. told, and take this with a big fat grain of skepticism again, but apparently most of the competent devs have indeed left Sucker Punch quietly no. already. I cannot no. confirm this, but from what I'm being told, the key talent behind Tsushima have left amidst the second game in the series being made. Oh, that is not Good. <laughs> Tsushima was a masterpiece, okay? Uh, everything about it was awesome. I don't know if it won Game of the Year or not. I should probably check that out. But, I mean, story, perfect. Uh, musical score, perfect. Visuals, perfect. Uh, Storyline, everything. Everything was so good in that game. I, I can't believe that they used a committee to create that game. That had to have been pre-committee uh, error era. Uh, but man, if the if the original dev team basically has left Sucker Punch while Yote was being made, or before Yote was being made, I, I'm sorry. I think. <laughs> I want Yote to be so good. I really do. But everything is pointing that it's going to be garbage. It's going to be trash. Uh, it's going to be beautiful trash, but it's going to be trash. I, I, it's going to be DEI trash. I don't know. I hope I'm wrong. I was told that originally Yote was not the original game idea at all. It was actually indeed Ghost of Tsushima 2 starring Jin Sakai. And that is actually what everybody wanted. Everybody was like screaming, we want a sequel to Jin's story because Jin is so awesome. He is such a good character. One of the best written characters, I think, in all of gaming history, in my humble opinion. And everybody wanted to see his story continued. I mean, conceptually, I think at least the way they're spinning it right now, like having like the ghost mantle being placed on different people throughout history. That is actually a very cool concept, but they really should have done Jin's story next for a true ghost of Tsushima sequel. Um, Do the Yote after for, for the next one, but everybody wanted to see Jin because we all love him. But sometime during development, a lot like Shadows, the game was halted and then completely changed in vision. This Atsu character we see was not originally decided to be the main character of this game. And apparently, according to my sources, Yote's world and design are largely based on the assets that were being used while making Tsushima 2. Apparently, work began on Tsushima 2 around two months after the official sales data came through on the first game's success. Wow. A skeleton crew was left behind to work on the Legends multiplayer, and the same team made the Iki Island DLC expansion as well. 
From what I'm told in terms of Yote, the team that made the Icky Island DLC are the primary devs on this game. And the actual sucker punch that's left is allegedly mostly working on something else. Take this with your grains of salt or whatever people say, but yeah, Yote was not the original vision. And Key Talent has left Sucker Punch, just like it happened with Rocksteady when Suicide Squad was being made as well. Uh. I was also told, do not expect Yote in 2025 at all. Apparently the game's nowhere near being done. Wow. But it's a very slim chance at best that this game actually releases in 2025. That's amazing because they totally said 2025. Why? <laughs> they should have just said coming coming soon or something, you know? <laughs> Oh, that's going to disappoint uh, everybody that wants to play this game, or at least see what it's like. Oh gosh, I hate when they do that. It could very easily fall into 2026, but if you're getting your hopes up for it coming out next year, probably don't do that. Every source that I spoke to say that they fully expect a delay at some point to be announced. Originally, apparently they wanted this Tsushima sequel to drop close to John Wick's director's vision of the movie to capitalize on sales. But these changes from Tsushima 2 to Yote happened, apparently, within the last year. So the entire really? vision of the project has been changed. The era of placing the game 300 years into the future from Tsushima 1's story was decided because it would be more believable in Sucker Punch's eternal talks for the game to star a woman at that point instead. Okay, I don't understand that logic. I don't follow that logic at all. That, that doesn't, make, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. I mean, just because you're doing it 300 years in the future, why does that automatically mean it makes sense to have a woman in there? That, that... Okay, whatever. Especially considering Atsu would then have access to things like firearms to fight back against enemies as well. As I was also told further, Ghost of Tsushima 2 was described as Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, but way better in every single way. The mm. game was supposed to move Jin Sakai further into the Japanese mainland to fight the Mongols. Yeah. As I was told, Tsushima 2 was meant to be about Jin creating his own Brotherhood of Ghosts, a lot like Ezio does with the Brotherhood of Assassins as well. That would be so awesome! Oh my gosh! <laughs> that would have been epic! Why did they go away from that? In that game too. The idea was that Jin knew he couldn't face the Mongols alone, and therefore would train eager and talented young Japanese into capable warriors that could help him strike in multiple areas at once. And that was kind of uh, what they did in the first game, because it always seemed like, you know, Jin, it was always just, you know, basically him going against the whole entire Mongol army. So they'd have to get like, uh, like small little bands that like maybe defected from the main army, from his uncle's band or whatever clan <laughs> however they had it all set up uh but yeah like it was just like they, they they just kept on like putting together these small bands of uh well i guess they would have been considered uh traitors or whatever because they left the army dissenters or whatever but uh yeah and that's one of the aspects that made when they did go on the big battles near the end of the game uh, why it made it so cool and that the continuation of that and making an actual ghost like i don't know that would have been really cool which would then give credence to the idea that the ghost as in Jin and the legend were indeed everywhere at once around japan and if they would have done that doing the ghost of yote would have been a natural progression in that concept, because like the whole ghost clan or whatever you want to call them, they obviously wouldn't have died when Jin finally dies of whatever means, probably old age, hopefully. Uh, but that tradition of the ghost, the secret underground behind the scenes shadow clan or whatever, that could have continued. And then this uh, Atsu could have been just part of maybe her father was part of the clan the the shadow clan the ghost clan right and maybe she just fell into it and because the game looks like it's some kind of like revenge themed you know she's got the hit list she's like uh, crossing out the name right <laughs> with the blood which is totally badass um but yeah it's uh that would have been that would have totally made sense for ghost of yote 
and then you could have just done exactly what they wanted to do and just pick any time period after Jin was uh, formed that that ghost clan and and then just thrown that mantle onto anybody and it would have been it would have been epic it would have been like another assassin's creed franchise you would have just been printing money and now we'll see which would obviously scare the mongols and then make the urban legend even more terrifying to them there was meant to be huge cinematic battles where Jin and his ghosts would ride and face off against the Mongols as well. Yote is also allegedly being developed as a cross-gen game for PS5 and PS4, because Sucker Punch and Sony are worried that the game won't sell as well if it isn't available to a larger install base. Hmm. So for you out there who saw the Yote trailer and went, this looks exactly the same graphically as Tsushima, which wasn't an ugly game, mind I you. Did. It's beautiful. Even <laughs> yeah, it's totally beautiful. And it looks exactly like uh, the Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, I have no problems with that. <laughs> even to this day, well, now you have your answer. Although, as I'm told, Yote may be smaller than the original Tsushima because of the development problems behind the scene, and the fact that they sidelined Jin Sakai for this new Atsu hero instead. This led to a lot of asset flips and the story changing, but the core idea of Jin being hunted by Ronin was kept, but of course, he was replaced by Atsu instead. I was also told by another source that the ending of Yote will piss people off, however, they couldn't reveal more of that yet. I wasn't given specifics on what this could mean, however, I don't know how Yote's ending could piss people off. Mm -hmm. The only conclusion I could make in my own head about this was that Yote's story will feature moments where you do play as Jin, although in flashbacks. And I would wager if they mean the ending will piss people off, I would assume, and I could be wrong, but let me cook here, but imagine throughout <laughs> the story you play some parts as Jin whenever his legend is being brought up by the people of Yote. This way, Sucker Punch can reuse whatever missions they canceled as content within the game to satiate the Tsushima fans. If I had to guess why the ending would piss anyone off, my shot in the dark here is that we learn that Jin Sakai is not successful in the battle against the Mongols, and that he likely dies during some pivotal moments during the invasion in order to either save someone or his clan by giving his life and would likely end his legend within Yote while still being able to play as Atsu because you would learn that Jin Sakai ultimately failed, but his legacy would live on with his remaining ghost that he fostered, and they would in turn eventually win the war and stave off the Mongol invasion. I actually don't have too many problems with that. I mean, that kind of seems like it could be realistic. I mean, you know... Uh, I don't know. That doesn't seem too terribly bad. That's the only way I could imagine the ending pissing people off, but I assume that they will confirm that Jin died before he could actualize his efforts, which would then close the book on his story so that fans don't demand more content from him. And this then mm. allows Atsu to live on, and then it answers that lingering question. But like I said, Asian men are now being viewed as disposable when it comes to representation by the West, the same way that white men are too, so... Welcome to the club, buddy. <laughs> uh, we're an inclusive club now. Uh, <laughs> we'll take more, more people. <laughs> ah, brother. Ay -ay -ay. None of this would really surprise me, really. I was also told that people within Sony are leaking information about all sorts of games and developments to people on the outside, hence how I heard about this from my sources. Apparently, a lot of questions are being asked internally about things like Ghost of Yote especially. Many are feeling blindsided by its announcement, and like I said, since allegedly Yote was changed from Tsushima 2 to what it is now within the last year, a lot of the PR people and marketing developments were not made aware in time about Ghost 2 suddenly pivoting to a new main character with what? a sudden 300 you know year time jump or anything like that. what <laughs> so a lot of people are confused and scrambling for answers right now wondering why they were left in the dark about this how does that happen you don't even tell your pr people oh jeez man there's a breakdown somewhere uh that 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 system is broken Maybe because Sucker Punch knew if others were made aware, they would push against it, but like I was told, many of the key talent has either left Sucker Punch entirely, or they are not actively working on Yote. As I was also told, if Yote's reception does not improve, this could scale the game back in terms of scope and resources. 
If Sony starts to notice the public opinion on this game is not changing for the better, they'll opt for a smaller overall content package. So I wouldn't be surprised if Yote releases at $60 Canadian or $50 American, instead of the usual premium price point of $70 American as it is right now, or $80.90 for Canadians. Hmm. Or maybe they just don't care, and they'll just release it at full price anyways, and they'll just hope that the name alone will still sell it regardless. I think that's probably more the case. <laughs> you know, why, why give up some money if they, they think they can get away with that? I am told that Sony is developing future Ghost titles, but I wasn't given specifics on where they would be set. So if I guess you think of some setting that would be dope for one of these games, let me know in the comments. And I was also told that the voice actor for Atsu in Ghost of Yote is a nightmare to work with, and even other woke people think that she's absolutely crazy. But again, this is what I'm being told. I don't want to accuse the voice actor too much because I can't verify this 100%. Oh, man. But man, you know you're bad if other woke people think you're nuts. <laughs> man, she must be like delusional or something. Jeez, this is not looking good. Yeah, from what I'm being told, they are an insane woke activist that makes other insane woke activists go damn. That chick is one insane woke activist, man. They could be a very nice person, but that's not what I'm hearing. If I hear more, I'll let you know. Mm. None of this is sadly surprising since Cabrutus Rambo posted a bit back how Sony is looking to dive more into DEI nonsense in the future. And I mean, I did get attacked a lot from my comments on Ghost of Yotai as well as other games, but as time has gone on, it just seems that more people are turning to my side on these things. And look, it's okay if I get attacked. I'll keep speaking the truth because that matters more than anything else. That is true. And that's actually one of the things, like my first episode, I, I, when I talked about DEI, um, about when I, I, I previewed the, the trailer and, um, you know, I just felt like I had to talk about uh, DEI and because it is, it's the truth, whether people want to believe it or not, or if they want to fight against it, I don't know why, I don't know. But anyways, it's true. It's true. Uh, like, it, like we take a big chance in in having this <laughs> toxic positivity or whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you, buddy. We're in it for the long haul. <laughs> Do I think Sony will continue to push these concepts in the future for the short term? Yes. But I think if people vote with their wallets, it'll be largely abandoned, hopefully. The reception to Ghost of Yote, it has been nothing short of mixed. And the fact I reported before that Yasuke was inspired by Black Lives Matter is the cherry on top of the crap pie, and it's crazy that that got confirmed <laughs> by not one, but multiple sources to me. You yeah, and uh, it's also being reported that uh, some of the things that are going to be changing uh, in Assassin's Creed Shadows, uh, because they pushed it back to February, which is also in Black Lives, uh, or not Black Lives, but Black History Month, which is a little bit ironic. Uh, but uh, apparently there's a whole bunch of dialogue that they're stripping out of the game that Yasuke, uh, Yasuke says, because um, apparently it's all... I don't know. I am being oppressed. I'm a I'm a black man sold by white uh, white men, or I, I don't know. I don't know what it is that he's saying, but apparently uh, it said that whatever this dialogue is now, they feel or somebody feels it would really piss off people in, when they play the game if they hear whatever it is Yasuke is talking about. So I find that very interesting uh, that they're planning on doing that. Could have had Taka Yamauchi, dear viewer, saving Japan from the Sword of Eden, but these studios are apparently very incompetent, full of diversity hires that are spending absurd amounts of money on contractors to actually make things work, which are largely white men in these roles. Am I saying white men are better at developing games? Not really, but it's weird that this is the narrative that I keep hearing from literally all of my sources. So we might be seeing a Suicide Squad Rocksteady situation with Sucker Punch and Yote, as for Shadows, mm. it's also apparently a buggy mess behind the scenes too. That's also what I was told. And none of this is really, you know, news, I guess, but it is very disappointing. But I did hear that there's at least one franchise Ubisoft is not going to make Woke in the future, and that is Ghost Recon. They apparently heard the fans when it comes to Breakpoint. Wow. So that sequel will be a no-nonsense pro-military game in every nice. conceivable way. As for everything else, however, fully expect this DI nonsense to keep happening. If it changes, 
that depends on your support so like always whether these things happen or not it's all up to you dear viewer that's what i got for now let me know what you think as always in the comments thank you for watching subscribe share and all of that thanks to my supporters and i'll see you in the next one all right well that's uh that's good news uh, that they're not touching Ghost Recon, apparently. I just don't understand why they're still moving forward with, with any of these other games and potentially franchise games. Uh, Ghost Recon, by the way, was awesome. It's on the channel, by the way. <laughs> Full game. Every mission, I believe every mission is on there. Uh, so yeah, check it out. And there's a couple, uh, like two, three guides or whatever to some good weapons and it's all, it's all good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, this was uh really juicy, um, uh, juicy stuff. Crazy. Anyways, thanks for, uh, watching. I do appreciate it and I appreciate your support. Please like, and subscribe if you, um, if you like what I'm doing here. Uh, and hopefully you can watch some, some of the gameplay video I do too. I've got a lot of games on the channel. It's just going to keep growing over time. Uh, so yes, thank you. Love you and have a great day. We'll, uh, we'll see you in the next video. Bye.